Welcome uh, back from uh, the break, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about numbers. I promise it won't be as boring as you think it will be. How many of you are afraid of numbers? All righty. Well, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about them. I'm not sure. Am I doing this with the uh, video? You're working on it. Okay. Um, I have that effect on numbers as well. It makes them scared. They want to run away from me, too. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the common use of uh, numbers and formulas and shelters. We're going to talk about how to get to better numbers within. I could not help myself. If we were going to talk about the importance of those numbers, I had to tell you how to get better numbers. So we'll walk on through the use of statistics in uh, the animal sheltering world. And it's no more true than what gets measured matters. Once you start looking at it, you start focusing on it, it's important. If you're not measuring it, it's not important. So let's talk about what are the important uh, standards and of industry specifications for sheltering. We all know there's three kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, and statistics. And we all know that there's use of statistics that sometimes is a little different than what we thought they were. Sometimes statistics are used to prove a point. Sometimes they're proved to beat you over the head with them. We want to figure out a way to use numbers and st statistics and measurement to improve our situation and our ability to care for animals. Now, this morning I talked about not using numbers when you're talking for donor cultivation, when you're trying to move the needle, but there is a place for them. When we want to talk about uh, when we use numbers, we demonstrate fluency and competency. Uh, people get impressed when you know what your rate of change is, what your live release rate is, where you are and where you're going. It's required by many foundations. So they want to have specific numerical measurements so they can compare you against other shelters. Um, some donors desire it. I tend to find that most of our donors, they want to hear about Fluffy. They want to hear about Spot. They're not really interested unless you've got something really earth shattering. If it's not earth shattering, um, I would stick to telling stories. Um, here's some common benchmarks that we use in the sheltering world. Live intake the number of animals you took in alive, and then you had to do something with it. Total adoptions, that live release rate. Can I call that save rate? Are you okay with that? I know Emily Weiss, Dr. Weiss at the ASPCA is going to have my hide over that one, but I have a trouble saying L's and R's. At the end of the day, um, it's how many lives that came through your shelter that left as a live outcome, called your live release rate. I prefer to call it save rate. Euthanasia rate, that's important when you're looking at the number of animals that did not leave alive. Um, and the length of stay, we've talked, touched on a number of times that term, length of stay. What is the average length of time an animal stays in your shelter? And monitoring that length of stay is critical to increasing that save rate up above. Your return on investment. That's critical when we're talking about how much did it cost you to put on a special event. What's your return on investment? Does it take this for every 10 cents, uh, for every dollar you spend on a special event? Are you getting a dollar in return? Or are you getting 50 cents in return? Or are you getting $10 in return? Your return on investment is an important factor. Certainly in the U.S., whether we exist as a charity depends on the percentage that we spend on programs and not on administration and fundraising. The return on investment for donor dollars um, keeps us to have that uh, charitable standing. Uh, and then community impact. How many more lives are you saving? What's the rate of decrease of intake at shelters? Are we having an impact? If we can't demonstrate we're having an impact, then why are we doing it? But knowing those numbers and being able to talk about them makes you sound, one, really smart, but helps you get to zero because you know where you are and you know what is, when you're starting to make progress and whether anything you're doing has any impact. Length of stay is the average length of time a pet stays in your shelter. It can be calculated in a number of ways, um, usually, we don't include the time spent in foster. We may not include the time spent in 
in, in cruelty holds, but we want to know what the length of stay in a shelter because there's a magical number to that. And uh, to demonstrate about length of stay and how it's calculated, there's a fun little video and we're going to play that now. Stay with me and watch this little cartoon about length of stay. Go ahead. Hi there. Today we're going to be playing a learning game. I hate these mandatory staff meetings. Now we all know you love our usual games like Nowhere to Hide, But the Litter Box, or the Deworming Game. How about a nice banana shake? <laughs> but today we're going to play the Length of Stay game. Let's see how thinking about length of stay can make your shelter a happier, healthier place to be so you can save more lives. I just can't wait to see what happens. Here are the rules. We have two shelters, Shelter A and Shelter B. Sounds fun, right? Every 30 seconds, each shelter has an intake. One of our fantabulous volunteers comes up and takes a seat in one of these lovely chairs. But here's the trick. In Shelter B, every animal stays for three minutes before adoption. In Shelter A, they only stay for one minute. So let's divide up into two groups and count off by ten. One, two, three, four. All right, number ones, come on up and get us started. Take a seat, grab an empty cage in your shelter. As we begin, we fast forward through 30 seconds. And at one minute, Shelter A is already adopting out their first pet. Now we're at two minutes. Yep, another adopt. Oh, embedded videos in PowerPoint. <laughs> IT's looking at me. I'm looking at IT. <laughs> it locked up. Oh, I'm sorry. Your, our length of stay watching this video has just increased. So, yes, <laughs> let's keep going. Hi there. Today, we're going to be playing a learning game. I hate these mandatory staff meetings. Now, we all know you love our usual games like Nowhere to Hide, But the Litter Box, or the Deworming Game. How about a nice banana shake? <laughs> but today, we're going to play the Length of Stay game. Let's see how thinking about Length of Stay can make your shelter a happier, healthier place to be so you can save more lives. I just can't wait to see what happens. Here are the rules. We have two shelters, Shelter A and Shelter B. Sounds fun, right? Every 30 seconds, each shelter has an intake. One of our fantabulous volunteers comes up and takes a seat in one of these lovely chairs. But here's the trick. In Shelter B, every animal stays for three minutes before adoption. In Shelter A, they only stay for one minute. So let's divide up into two groups and count off by ten. One, two, three, four. All right, number ones, come on up and get us started. Take a seat, grab an empty cage in your shelter. As we begin, we fast forward through 30 seconds. And at one minute, Shelter A is already adopting out their first pet. Now we're at two minutes. Yep, another adopt. It's corruptive. It's toast. I gotta talk about it? Oh my gosh. Lila, you want to bail me out here? No. No, she's like, dude, you're so on your own for talking about length of stay. The reason why we talk about length of stay is it has tremendous implications for our, the outcomes for your animals. The longer animals stay in your shelter, the more opportunity they have to get sick, they got more opportunity to get stressed, you suffer from overcrowding, the animal, your ability to have a live outcome becomes really reduced the longer your length of stay. So we track that length of stay because when it starts getting beyond seven days, beyond eight days, beyond 10 days, you're starting to push into when those animals are going to have repercussions from the confinement. I heard yesterday at dinner that um, some agencies, perhaps it's some requirement that you hold animals for an eight-day quarantine period coming in. I'm not sure what the rationale or the, behind that is. I'm not sure if you can change that, but I do understand the reper repercussions of taking animals off the street and putting them in a shelter and making them sit for eight days. For us, the clock ticks, that moment comes into our custody, and we're watching it. 
We want to know, can we get them through sooner? They come in, they're vaccinated upon arrival, they're probably wormed at the same time, they're collared, ID'd. Uh, for most animals, we're doing a behavioral assessment. It's the same day unless the pet needs to settle. Uh, and then we're scheduling for surgery the next day. For example, some of our large transports, we accept animals from over 60 agencies. Those animals come in on a Tuesday. There's 40 to 70 that come in from one shelter alone every week. Uh, those animals are, are readied for adoption. On Wednesday and Thursday, they're spayed and neutered, and on Thursday, they go up for adoption. And I can tell you, by Sunday, most of them are gone. So we put a high value at getting animals into the shelter, ready for adoption, and getting them out the door. Our length of stay for cats, for adult cats, including our cruelty cases, is about 19 days. And we're working really hard to cut that in half. We would like to see a seven to 10 day uh, length of stay for adult cats. For kittens, it's four days. For dogs, it's seven days. For puppies, it's back to four days. And these are fertile animals coming in, being sterilized, and moving out for adoption. Length of stay is critical to keeping pets, watching length of stay is critical to keeping pets healthy in your shelter, keeping them sane in your shelter, and moving them into a new home. Tricks to reducing that length of stay, prepare for adoption sooner. For instance, if you're taking in um, stray animals that are coming in, make them, make them available for viewing to your clients. It's called open selection. They can't complete the transaction and you can't desex them until they become through that stray holding period, but clients can sure fall in love. So instead of waiting until Day seven, his stray hold period is up. Now you start looking at him. Now you start doing a behavioral assessment. But you've always got that lump in his ear. Can we have the veterinary staff or we have to send him out to get that looked at? Tick tock, we're at day 14. And then we now are going to get him desexed. Now we're going to put him up for adoption. And we're already got this dog for 20 days. If you had open selection for the animals you know are not going to be problems, are safe for your clients to look at, they can look at him. And they can say, you know, I want to see that dog when he's available for adoption. You have someone ready to go when, you're, when that dog's holding period is up. So the day the dog's holding period is up is the day he's going to get sterilized and get ready for adoption. You don't start the clock when the animal's available to be put up. You start the clock when he becomes in your care. You may have some built-in delays, but get preparing for adoption sooner is really important. Fast tracking is a strategy to put the animals that are ready for adoption up for adoption quickly. If you've got cute things, get them out the door because they're going to keep moving. To spend the time on the animals that you have to spend the time on, but make sure that you don't delay in putting up those little orange tabby fluffy kittens because you know the day they go up is the day they're going to go home. If you're going to spend your time working on the 10-year-old cat who's got diabetes and he really needs a workup and that dental thing, he's got to have dentistry and he's just got a mouth of gunky teeth, if you spend your time on that one, that kitten's going to be sitting in the back area, exposed to disease, tick-tock, tick-tock, that length of stay continues to increase. We want to remove barriers to adoption. I don't know if any of you have it, but we used to have something where we didn't want people to, to make any sudden decisions. We didn't want to impulse buying. If you came in and fell in love, you had to wait three days. We're not sure if you're really in love with this dog. We're not sure you're going to be a good pet owner. You know, we make pretty good decisions. In fact, I think we make better decisions about pets than we do about spouses. Now, my husband's not in the room, is he here? Right, good. Okay, we can talk here. Yes. Um, you know, human divorce rate in the U.S. is about 50%. We look at our return rate for pets. In the worst shelters, what is it, 15%, 20%? I don't really care about returns. We're putting up for adoption animals we don't know much about. Owners may or may not have told us the truth about Buffy. Maybe they made it glossy. Maybe they made him like a sinner. I don't know if he's a saint. Um, but... We don't need to make clients wait. We need to trust clients who make the right decisions. So mandatory wait times, doing reference checks. Well, we got to call them, find your, ask your vet if you were a good pet owner. You know, our applications are long. We ask all kinds of gotcha questions. 
We want to know. We, we can trip you up and find out you're really going to use this animal for satanic worship or what our worst fears are. Uh, we need to start from that position of trust and wait till clients give a reason to not trust them before we drop them. Those are barriers to adoption. Requiring all family members meet, a study came out last month about pet mates. You are more likely to have inter, 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 uh, aggression within a shelter and a pet meet than you are sending that pet home. If pet clients want to meet, great, but don't make them bring in the family, the kids, the grandmother who visits once a month, the spouse that they've been estranged from for six months. Um, those are ways that we jam up our adoption process and they add to our length of stay. How do we calculate it? Simple formula, divide the live outcomes, and those are defined as adoptions, transfers, RTOs, return to owners if you're having a, doing stray animal holding, by total outcomes. Live outcomes, which are, could be um, live outcomes uh, plus euthanasia, but not owner released or owner requested euthanasia or diet and care. All of these formulas and my slides are gonna be on the website when Nell surfaces from getting her horse stitched up and recovering from this workshop. So um, don't worry about too much about this. And of course you can always find all these formulas on ASPCA.pro. Uh, Live release rate calculation. So if you adopted 1,552 animals, you transferred out to rescue groups, 214, you returned to owner, 407, and you euthanized 397. Using that calculation, you, know, you are in an 84% live release rate. There are lots of different formulas being offered as live release rate. Some of them, how do I say this? Some of them are almost prejudicial to make shelters look bad. We use the calculations in accordance with the Asilomar Accords, simple calculations that everybody can understand. It's not your adoption, you know, some of the, the distorted calculations are your adoption rate is based on the number of animals that, weren't, that, were, all, that were left over after they were returned to owner. It's like, you know, it's about live outcomes here. And we've got to talk about live release rate. And this is a universal calculation you can use to compare your shelter against other agencies. If you look on a Silomar Accords uh, on their website, they have lists of shelters that have w been willing to publish their data. And you can see where you stack up. Find other agencies you want to emulate and benchmark to and look at what their live release rate is and see how you, how you compare. Maybe you've got the best one of the pack. That's something your donors want to know. That's something you want to talk about to foundations. But you know 84%? That's 16% that ain't making it out of your shelter. That's the ones you've got to worry about and that's the ones we've got to work on. It's a great live release rate and that is awesome. We still have work to do. And we know that because we've done these calculations. Back to length of stay. Simplest way, calculate to simply add up all the days the animals remain in the shelter's care and divide by the number of animals. You need both the intake date and outcome date for an animal. Here's an example of a simple length of stay. You don't need to do this if you've got 300 animals in your care. You don't need to do it for every animal. Let's just take a month's worth of data or um, two months worth of data or a year's worth of data if you're a smaller agency. Get some handle on how long animals are staying in your care. Um, some animals are going to stay a long time. You know, I... I wish everyone would come in and want the black lab with the limp. And I'm pretty sure someone will. I got hope. I've seen it happen over and over and over again that they will. But those black labs with the limp, they take a little longer. That special home to find its way into your facility. Um, the one day one, that was the Persian cat that was spayed and neutered when he came to you. You got him up for adoption and he went out the same day. Some days those cute little animals come in. We always joke we're not gonna dirty a kennel with them. Just get some volunteer to walk around with him under his arm. See if you can't find a home for him. Just like wind through the kennels there, talk to clients, don't even put him in a kennel. Let's just get him up for adoption and get him out. 
So with that, we have 49 uh, total days in care, divided by the number of animals, seven day length of stay. Oh, this is a complicated chart you can't see, so I can say anything I want about it, can I? These, uh, these will also be in the slides. This is um, our one month uh, snapshot of stats that we use to inform our board of trustees. Um, it also has, what it has in it is month to month, year to year data and percent change so that we know that um, whether we're doing better or worse than last year at a simple shot, we can also look at seasonality. Um, these are published internally in our organization every month. They're available to volunteers, staff, board members. If the public wanted them, I'd be happy to give it to them. This is a little bigger version of that to look at, this is just looking at July 2013. Uh, we had 8% fewer animals to deal with in July, and year to date we had 2% less. Euthanasia is down 25% year to date. Love seeing those numbers, and I can tell that because it's all calculated here. Um, this is uh, a report that uh, we get from data out of Shelter Buddy. It's not a standard report. This is the one I love the most, and you still can't see it. This is our length of stay dashboard. This tells us about, let's see if I got a smaller one here, no. Nope. Um, this tells us about animals that have been in our care by strata. How many have been here less than zero to seven days, 14 days, more than 21 days. It tells us what's coming in, because down below on this, on this uh, I'm told, a pointer, yes, uh, has down here what we know is coming in on appointments so we can schedule our, we can be prepared for those animals coming in. We know by location, the number of animals going out. This gives your staff the best handle on the animals in your care. Because if you don't know about them and you don't know where you're doing, I can't see how you can do better until you know where you stand. And another complicated spreadsheet, completely unintelligible by the audience. This is our no animal left behind report. So when we have animals that have been here more than 21 days, they have an individual listing. And we talk about them. Well, why have they been here? Well, he's got to have dental care. Oh, he's in foster care because he had a broken leg. You know what? He's in bike quarantine for the third time. It's a chihuahua. Come on. <laughs> he's going to bite. And we're going to get them through by quarantine. But we talk about each individual animal. And what's on this report isn't just the animal's number, it's the pet's name. Because I want to care about each one of those animals. So we have this conversation. Our management teams meet, huddle, and discuss the outcome of each one of these pets. This goes on for too many pages. At any time, we have 400 animals in our care between uh, foster care and in our shelter. So um, for some of them, they could be here for some time if we have a big cruelty case. For your resources, I urge you to participate in the Asilomar Accords. Look up on it. It's really complicated. I'm happy to help talk anyone through how to incorporate Asilomar Accords into your both or or own organization and as a coalition. The National Federation of Humane Societies um, has a simple matrix, really about six or eight categories. What did you get and what did you do with it? So we can start to talk about the scope of the problem and start talking about what the resources are. You know what? I had no idea you got 300 animals a month. We can start talking as a community where the, what the source of animals are and where these animals are going and what our ability as a community and how we're going to get to zero because we know where we stand today. Now you can watch that video. I know now you're all queued up. You gotta see the end of that video. Um, uh, here's the link to it. You can click on it from the PowerPoint, but it, also if you go to ASPCA Pro, you can download it. Or I think ASV, the Association of Shelter Veterinarians also has that link, the stay game. And then the ASPCA Pro website. Honest, I'm not paid by the A to talk about it. Um, I just love the materials out there because they're free. You don't have to pay for them. It's available. Look at them tonight if you want. Have your staff go look at it. Lots of great information. So in closing, I urge you to get really good control on what your numbers are, how to use them, and be fluent in the statistics that you use every day so that you know where you are. And when we get to zero, we know we've gotten there.
We know how close we are. We know when we hit that magical 90% save rate. We know how far we need to go and how far we came for next year because you know what we do as an animal sheltering business? We don't celebrate. We never stop. It's like, ah, yeah, you know, we made that, but we got to move on because I got more cats coming in and I got dogs over there and I got to go clean kennels. The nice thing about having these numbers is we can stop and celebrate when Tippy gets a home because Tippy's been here 76 days. And we can stop and celebrate when we've seen that live release rate go up two points or we drop that, that length of stay down a day. Numbers give us the ability to know where we are, have a good handle on where we're going, and they just give us a universal language. So if I haven't sold you on stats, I'm sorry. It was all the videos felt that wouldn't run, right? Um, happy to answer any questions when we're done, but um, thank you for your time today.